Welcome to Off the Press, the program where we take a look at the national dailies and make sense of it. For today's program, I'll be joined virtually by the very seasoned analyst, Ezekiel Iyak Etuk. Welcome to the program, sir. Thanks. Nice to be here. All right. So I would like us to start off uh, first with the uh, dailies uh, with the Nigerian Tribune. The headline here says, Magu cries over fair hearing lawyer rights salami panel. And uh, we see here that uh, EFCC probe also alleges attempt by uh, Lebanese uh, to smuggle $890,000. Another big story here on the, the paper is uh, uh, the death of Walter Carrington. He unfortunately passed away at 90, and that news was uh, announced by his uh, wife. Also, the SLS grills Malafia for six hours, releases him on bail. And that's on page 29 of the Nigerian Tribune. And uh, still on page 29, the Nigerian Tribune has this story on their front page. A rotile driver, vehicle owner arraigned in Kaduna. So we're seeing uh, uh, action there uh, by the government as well uh, to make sure that justice is done over the death of that very amazing first female Nigeria combat helicopter pilot. And now we see that uh, on the punch, the stories here making the headlines is... Uh, On Tribune, we still have uh, the death of the Lagos Council boss here on page four. It says Lagos Council boss dies of COVID-19. Uh, that's, uh, that's a sad one right there. And now onto this uh, controversial story uh, on page 28 of the Tribune. Sharia court sentences 70-year-old to death for raping a 10-year-old. So sad that uh, these issues of rape still persist in society. And on page 28, soldier jailed for 55 years, and that's for killing the staff of the World Health Organization. Uh, finally, some uh, prosecution here we've been talking about uh, on the news uh, with analysts uh, a few moments ago. Also here, we see that the federal government is set to deduct money from states guilty of double taxation. So states guilty of double taxation at uh, received deductions. Uh, as well, we see an audit query. The MPA, Nigeria Port Authority, uh, it has recovered $89 million, as well as 2.404 billion naira as outstanding rental debt. Oh, those are the stories making the front page of the Nigerian Tribune. And uh, uh, let's, let's, let's uh, find out, uh, uh, Ezekiel uh, uh Thanks again for joining us. So let's see, which of those uh, stories on the Nigerian Tribune would, would you say really, really caught your attention today? So many of them, but I would say I would like to start with the Magus. Magus typifies this administration, the way things are done, and I hope that they look at things and change the approach. Number one, if Mr. President gave an instruction as a matching order for the panel that the panel should conduct its affairs openly and the panel chooses to do that privately, the first question is, is there a disregard to the instruction of Mr. President? Can that ever be or was there a change and if there was such a change wouldn't it just be proper for for it to be communicated so that the public do not think that the instruction of mr president has been flouted uh, this has happened before when mr president said ig i, I thought i asked you to be in uh, i think it was ben west state uh, and he was shocked and surprised that that instruction that he gave was not followed so I think it's important that we let the administration know that we, the generality of the people, will see Mr. President as the ultimate, whose laws must never be flouted by others, talk less his own um, um, uh, administration. So I think it's absolutely important that we take that. Those are the, the little pointers that tell us how the administration uh, takes Mr. President. That is number one. Number two, I've said it time and time again. One of the biggest fields of corruption is secrecy. 
as long as things are done in secret, likelihood is that you know there'll be a lot of cover up, there'll be a lot of protection, there'll be a lot of things that really do not um, um, go well. But when things are done openly, there is transparency, there is accountability, there is the issue of being careless whose ox is God. Now that inspires confidence in the people. And Mr. Magu is crying out. He said, I'm not getting fair hearing. He's saying that this thing is not being done properly. I'm not, and it's just his word against the, uh, the, 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 the panel, and it is not good enough. I believe that there is need for the panel to be transparent and to show that justice is served. And when Mr. Mahu says anything, and let me even say this before I end on this matter, that it is not difficult for us to understand why um, <laughs> there, there's a secrecy. The reason is simple. The level of corruption at high places is such that it needs a certain willpower to just let it go. And Mr. President had come as that person that couldn't care less who you are. You do the crime, you do time. That's the person we've understood Mr. President to be. And towards the end of his um, second tenure, we are starting to ask ourselves, mm, is he actually a team player or is he the, the, the man that takes no prisoners? So I think that Mr. President needs to be careful not to um, uh, soil his image. Now that much for Mr. Malcolm and a lot more that we will have to say. But for now, let me, for reason of time, leave it there because there are a lot of very interesting stories. Now, if you look at the other story that talks about uh, my brother, my love here, yeah, being uh, quizzed uh, for saying something that I, I actually ask us as Nigerians, does this really come as a surprise to us? Is it really something that is like, wow, make that revelation? We have Nigeria, the giant of Africa, contending with Boko Haram. It doesn't take rocket science for us to know that there's something they are sponsors, and those sponsors cannot be, you know, little fries. Where are they getting all the money from? Where are they getting the boldness, the audacity? You know, your, your small boy can actually go up to a big man and slap the person. And don't take it long for you to turn back and say that the father is behind. That is where audacity comes from. That's where boldness comes from. That's that effrontery, you know, what we call the animal boldness. That's where it comes from. That knowledge that you have, you have your back covered. Now, if they are to do this, then definitely, definitely something is going down. And I'm happy that he was called, he was pleased, he was released. And the Northern governors have said, please don't let it end there. Getting back to investigation. And I look forward to us having an open investigation into the matter. What's happening in Nigeria is not rocket science. Yes, you want to say something? Interesting. No, yeah, you can wrap up. Uh, then we go over uh, to see what's making headlines in the Punch newspaper. Unfortunately, I didn't get that. Yes. Moving on now to the Punch newspaper, we see here on the front page that the APC interim panel battles against time, the party to shift convention. That uh, the major story on the Punch today, APC interim panel battles against time, party to shift convention. And uh, we also see that uh, experts fear downturn in Nigeria as UK enters recession, and that's on page 24 of The Punch today. Also, the big story here, council removes and replaces Unilag Vice-Chancellor Ogundipe dismisses sacking. Council removes and replaces Unilag Vice-Chancellor Ogundipe dismisses sacking. Uh, this is quite a controversial one on The Punch. Also, we see that army probes alleged soldiers' involvement 
in illegal fishing and trading. Wow. And uh, a political news here for you will impeach Obasiki if he flouts laws, Edo Assembly faction boasts. And uh, uh, what else do we have here? Committee to meet next week, yet to begin reconciliation. And that's still on the major story of the APC interim panel. We also see that Sam Wolu here on the front page of the Punch newspaper is decrying Lagos representation in the federal government agencies. Sam Wolu decries Lagos representation in FG agencies. Also on page 11, the story here of the U.S. envoy uh, who has uh, passed on at 90. So ex-U.S. envoy to Nigeria, Walter Carrington, dies at 90. And uh, also we have for the uh, International Youth Day, we see a message here from a passenger saying, send old generation out of power, a passenger tells the youth. So Mr. Iaketok, uh, which of these stories would you like to uh, shine a light on this morning? Well, they say the first shall be the last, the last could be the first. Let me start with the last story coming from the elder statesman, OBJ. I'm concerned about the youth of this nation. And I've said it time and time again, the time has come for them to wake up and know that we are living in their time. Now the useful age of, I mean, globally, it's like between 20 and 30, 35. If you go to look for work in a bank and you are 38, chances are that you may not get a job. Not to talk of in sports, if you are 25, by the time you like Messi is only, I mean, a little over 30, and they are thinking in terms of him retiring. And yet, we tell the youth that they are leaders of tomorrow. I don't understand that. I don't get that. And they are buying that narrative. Number one, I say this. I said something on the social media, and it went viral. I said, children are leaders of tomorrow. The youth are the leaders of today. At 25, I was married. You call me leader of tomorrow. At 30, I had my three children. You call me leader of tomorrow. At 37, I was the first Nigerian to get a facility from, from Shelter Africa and state government. And I did the estate. You call me leader of tomorrow. How? We need to tell the youth that this is their time. And then start to prime them for what you call responsibility transfer. Why would a man at 60, for goodness sake, want to be a local government chairman? Why would a man at 50 want to go and be a councillor? It, it, it just doesn't make sense. And then who is fueling the ambition of the old people? The young people. I can't imagine architect Nyego carrying ballot box and running. From where? How will I run? From where to where? And I think the time has come when we, the elderly people that God has so blessed should step in and start to mentor the youth and start the process of what I call responsibility transfer. It's not enough to say the youth are lazy youths, they are recalcitrant, they are this, they are that. Labeled is not enough. We've got to guide them and gradually, I look forward to a state governor who will say, I will not support any candidate who is above 40, who wants to be a councillor, who is above 35, who wants to be a councillor. I will not support you. It's democracy. You can go ahead and do what you want to do, but I will not support you. I will not support any candidate who is above 45, who wants to be a local government chairman. I will not support you. It's just saying, I look forward to such a governor. And Mr. President, I think that it's not enough to say it's not too young to run. I know Mr. President has said, okay, I agree you can run, but run after me. Now they were kind enough to allow him to take the second term. I see him, I look forward to him sitting down today as a father of the youth, the father of the new generation, and inspiring, having town hall meetings, if they be, you know, just, just picking the bright youths, positioning them, you know, Mr. Um, our former president, you know, uh, Obasanjo, uh, not Obasanjo, good luck, Jonathan, Dr. Good luck, Jonathan, picked some bright um, elements from the society and put them, look at a man like uh, Mr. Adeshino. He spotted the bright light and brought him on as minister. Today he's making Africa proud, not just Nigeria. There are a lot of young people who are doing well, and I look forward to Mr. President interfacing with them. 
hobnobbing with them and priming them to take up certain responsibilities, even in, in his cabinet. You know, let, let Mr. President know that the youth will respect him if he starts to lay a platform for the youth. Now, I would no, I'll take um, another, let's go to a dose state. I am concerned about what is going on in a dose state. I know that a lot of papers, I was expecting they would report it, but I don't know why they haven't done that. Why would the presidential task force on this COVID-19 not layers with INEC and insist that there must be no open air campaigning, no rallies. Rather, what makes more sense and will deepen our democracy, let them insist on town hall meetings, responsible town hall meetings. You can have 20 town hall meetings in a day. You just program yourself very well. Today you are in this um, ward, Two hours is enough, or one hour. You tell them what you want to do, you move to the next word, you move to the next word. All the rallies and shoutings and gesticulations and gyrations, they are not really necessary. These are the old orders. We are in a new order. We are in a new reality called post-COVID-19, if we can even call it post, you know, reality. And things must be done different. Things must be done. Let presidential task force just stop this issue of only uh, wash your hands, do this. Let let them go into something a lot more. A don't present a particular opportunity for them to interface with INEC. INEC is responsible for bringing out guidelines. You flout the guidelines, they wield the big stick on you. So this was an amazing opportunity. If we allow, if COVID is actually, they are making people to start to think that this COVID, I, I, had, I, I had a conversation with some young people. They said, oh, God, leave this COVID thing alone. Oh, God, this is a politics. Oh, God, see, a do, a do we get COVID. See, everybody, they move. People know they die. People are not falling on the street. The, the, the numbers on a do are not rising to 1,000. Oh, God, this thing is not real. And that's not a narrative that you want to try. Indeed. And you are inadvertently encouraging such narratives. But this was a time that, that presidential task force could have liaised with INEC and made sure that the guidelines made sure that all these gyrations are we, we do away with it in our politics. Indeed, Mr. Iyakechok. Moving on now to the Guardian newspaper and on COVID-19, as you've been discussing, we see that the federal government denies placing order for Russian vaccine. And that's the big story here on the Guardian FG denies placing order for Russian vaccine. And uh, a closer look at that story shows that Nigerian doctors have hailed those Russian scientists for the vaccine. New experimental COVID-19 drug prevents disease in mice. And that the U.S. government has striked a $1.525 billion deal for 100 million doses of this Russian vaccine. And the Federal Executive Council has now okayed for 8.49 billion naira for tests in local government areas. And uh, looking closely at uh, The Guardian as well, we see that Unilag Council is divided on sack of Vice Chancellor. And Ogundikpe is saying, I remain in charge. And the federal government awaits briefs on VC sack, as well as ASU fought in the action of the Unilag Council. And looking uh, still on The Guardian, we see uh, this story here on the third page saying the federal government mobilizes flights to evacuate Nigerians from the United Arab Emirates. And on page four, we see Lokman here alleging a plot to return Oshomale as APC chairman. And still in adult politics, on page 30 of the Guardian newspaper, politicians are massing arms to disrupt Edo poll, and that's according uh, to the CDC. And lastly, here on the Guardian, we see a story uh, saying why government hasn't adopted PCR for coronavirus testing by uh, Ehaniri. Uh, throwing it back to you now, Mr. Etuk. 
Yes, yes, yes. Let's go back to the vaccines. And again, again, the way our governments operate. Now there is the news that the Russians have got a vaccine. Definitely such news is going to be something that is going to generate a lot of uh, interest within the polity. And um, I expected there will be a statement that will either confirm, because for where we are today, it's, it's very easy. You don't need 24 hours to, for, for you to find out anything. For you to say, okay, this makes sense. We are looking into it, and then we'll now know what to do. Or we say, okay, yeah, it's a fact. It is established. We are making sure that we are taking steps to get the vaccines for Nigeria. Is the story that, that um, the U.S. has gotten several millions uh, place orders? Is it true or false? At the very same time, we are seeing you, you know, bring out over eight billion for us to go on this testing, testing, testing. Can we just take the next step and move from testing to preventive or something that will? Why, why do we always talk about testing, testing, testing? Why don't we tell people the things you can do to boost your body immunity so that you don't get it? Is it just this contract mentality? Money comes, we do contract, we do contract, we procure this, we procure that. Is this really what governance is all about? I'm concerned. So I, I think that we need to be a little more proactive in governance uh, by, by, by the steps we take. And let me tell you, by the time you have placed over 8 billion for testing, Nigerians are wondering, they're asking to, could it be that as always, you've all used the back door to place order and it's because you don't want people to know you are calling it testing. Do we really trust what government says? Is government really bothered about what the people think of them? This is very important. Mm -hmm. And then there was um, another very interesting story that I, I hope we can look at uh, before before we leave, because this time, I don't know what people do to time, but it's like the time runs um, a little faster. Okay, let's talk about um, Oshomole coming back through the back door. I, I really couldn't be bothered about that because um, this is what we all know. 2023 is coming, and whoever controls the national chairman, you know, has a very, very good um, uh, chances of um, getting hold of the system. So I expect that, and Oshomole does have, he must, might have his issues, but he actually does have a lot of things that go for him uh, as a man who, who can be almost authoritarian, in my opinion. Uh, and such people sometimes are needed when you want to give instruction and you want to ensure that that instruction is carried out. You don't want to have a man that is too um, democratic and seeking the, 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 the opinion of everybody. So I think that some people are definitely going to go for a man like Oshomole to come back as we head um, towards the home stretch uh, concerning, 20, uh, concerning 2023. And then we also talk about the federal government mobilizing flights to um, evacuate people from UAE. These are all the different stories. And that one, I believe that as long as we make sure that our foreign airlines are part of this whole evacuation. I think that um, it's something that will be encouraged. But still going back to a do election, I want Mr. President to take a personal interest because this election will define his presidency more than any other thing. I want Mr. President to take a personal interest. If a do goes wrong, Definitely, it emboldens Ondo to go wrong. And once Edo and Ondo go wrong, 2023, no matter how long the waste of time. But Mr. President should use a hammer, a sledgehammer, to kill a fly. We spare nothing just to ensure that we have free, fair, credible elections in Edo State. If he does that, he would have laid a foundation to exit in a place of glory. Thank you so much for your analysis, as always, Ezekiel Iyak-Etok. And uh, unfortunately, we're pressed for time to take the rest of the papers. Uh, but you've been watching uh, Off the Press on The Breakfast on uh, PLOS TV Africa. Do join us again tomorrow at 7 a.m. I am Annette Felix. Bye for now.